first of all, our first speaker tonight is Adrian Bryant, and he's a Braunton Parish councillor, and he's been leading on consulting landowners and other stakeholders about the introduction of beavers on the cane catchment. Um, Adrian is also a founding member of Braunton Regen, a local climate action group. So Adrian, I'll hand over to you to say a few words. Hello everyone, and Nicola, thanks very much. And also thanks because you, Braunton Countryside Centre, started me off on this journey because um, back in the autumn of 2019, they showed a brilliant film called Beaver Believers. And there were rather a lot of people at that showing. And there was also the National Trust and they gave a talk at the end of the film about their proposed project at that time, which was to put a pair of beavers into Holnicott water, uh, well, the Holnicott estate in, near Porlock in Somerset, um, enclosed. At, and that really grabbed me and inspired me. And as I cycled home to Knoll that evening, I, I cycled along the, the banks of the River Cane. And I, I thought, well, I, I wonder if beavers are a possibility here. Um, so time went by and things changed, life changed. Um, we didn't have meetings anymore. They, they suddenly went online for obvious reasons. And, uh, but during that time, I again saw more news about the National Trust project in Porlock. And then finally, the thing that really got it for me was I saw Chris Jones of the Beaver Trust talking about his project in Cornwall and his description of what beavers do for flooding uh, and, and why he got them in, into his farm at Laddock, which is in central Cornwall. It, I just thought, I, I'm going to contact Chris because, um, it, you know, possibly he could help out in Braunton because we've had several major flood events. The one that really sticks in my mind happened in 2012. Um, and because of being on the parish council, I, I get invited to lots of different climate events and um, climate emergencies were, were, were big news in councils in 2019. And Braunton Parish Council actually declared a climate emergency then. And ever since then, I've been thinking, well, what can I do? And beavers is one of those things that I can do. And I contacted Chris and amazingly, he replied and we've been talking ever since. So um, going on from that, we've teamed up with North Devon Biosphere and the Beaver Trust, and we formed a group. We meet regularly and from, the, from that, I started approaching landowners with stream right across the cane catchment. And that includes, includes null water, which flows into Rafton. All the branches that flow from North Buckland, from Trimstone, from Spraycombe, from West Down to Braunton. And remarkably, people have, have been very keen. I've got 42 landowners that have said they're willing to consider having beavers on their land. And that is a tremendously exciting prospect because at the moment, um, government legislation says that you, if you're going to have beavers on your land, you've got to put them in a fenced enclosure. Well, the fact that so many people have said yes, and some of them are all in a great long row together, the potential is that we, we could put a fence at the bo at one end of the valley and, and let beavers do their work, which is completely wonderful, by the way. Um, and it will be wonderful for our North Devon landscape um, for reasons for which um, Chris will explain. Uh, it's a really exciting prospect. Um, and uh, is it, Nicola, has Chris turned up? Yes, Chris is here now, I think. Brilliant. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to wind my introduction up and allow, allow Chris to speak. Um, but I'm going to leave you with a quote that I just saw from someone who's uh, the director of Rewilding Britain, 
and and he said that the most blindingly obvious catchment restoration tool are, are beavers. It, it just makes such common sense to use them and to use them as a tool against flooding and to answer the problems of climate change. Not, not just in Braunton, it, it should be across the country. It, 27 European countries are, are using them right now. They are being reintroduced across North America. Why not here? Okay, I shall leave you with that thought. And the other, the other thing is, at the end, we're gonna have a question and answer session. Uh, it would be lovely to hear your thoughts on this plan and your, any concerns you have, any experience you have to add to this. I, I am looking for people to plant trees at some point because we've got a lack of willow, which is an excellent beaver food. So if people are willing to help out with tree planting across the catchment, that would be wonderful to hear from you. Um, and just really your thoughts on the whole idea. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Adrian. I'm just going to say, um, Chris, are you there? Can you say hello? You just need to unmute if that's OK. Yes I, yes, I am here. Oh, thank um, you, Chris. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> You're doing just... such a great job, Adrian. Uh, <laughs> I'm well, we should carry on for another 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had to fill in, a, fill in a little bit, so we're glad that you're able to join us. So Chris Jones is an organic Thank livestock you. farmer from Cornwall, and he's been involved with setting up and running the Cornwall Beaver Project from its beginning, has been a proponent of widespread reintroduction of the species in appropriate places. He is one of the founders of the Beaver Trust and is his and is the restoration director. So, Chris, I'll hand over to you. Have you got a presentation that you wanted to I, share? I, I do have some slides now. Um, I need to work out what I'm doing with them. Um, I think you'll need to make me a. Uh, yes, I've added you on as the yeah. You're on as a co-host. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully, you should be able to share right, your so slides. Let's do that now. Hopefully. Hopefully the, these will uh, all kind of work. So let's do that. Share the screen. Okay. Is that visible to people? Yes, we can see that now, Chris. And can people hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Okay um um because if if you can't at any point just wave or something and, uh, and then I'll, I'll try and find a better place to go not always possible but i am out in the sticks here unlike sunny Brunton, which i'm sure is well served okay so um thanks very much nicola and thank you so much adrian now um what um uh, i'm going to do is, is go through a, a reasonably um generic uh set of slides um and some of them, if, if I think they're looking really boring, I'll go through them very, very quickly uh, and, and then hopefully linger on the ones which are more interesting. Um, and uh, please save up questions for the end. I don't know how you like to, to do the questions here. Uh, if, if you like to uh, put them on the, the uh, chat or, or, or whatever. Um, uh, it, it, do you have a protocol for that, Nicola? Yes, so what we're going to do is wait till you finish speaking and then if yeah. people want to put their questions in the chat, well, we can unmute them okay. and then they can ask you directly. Yeah. Uh, 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 okay, and um, uh, no matter how disappointing the slides, please, please do come back with lots of questions because uh, that's where the light gets in and, and, and we actually can find out a, a, a little bit of stuff. Okay, so uh, I'm Chris Jones, I'm from the Beaver Trust, um, which we set up two years ago, just about. Um, uh, with the idea of uh, restoring, restoring, oh, there we go, right. uh, restoring the, um, uh, the, the, the rivers of this country uh, and the wildlife that, uh, that's in them with beavers. Uh, and there's a whole thing, load of things to go with that. You know, we're really driven by the climate and ecological emergency. Um, I would like to think that most people by now have clocked on that climate change is happening. Uh, just one little tidbit. I think this is the uh, 
uh, I think we've had a dry spring every spring since 2013. I seem to remember it was quite wet in 2013. Uh, I, I uh, guess that would warrant some investigation, but we, we are getting very, very dry. And at the same time, we're getting very, very wet. Um, uh, we are, ju just as the predictions were, that we would get more extreme weather. Um, uh, overall, I think our, our rainfall is generally well down, but when it does rain, boy, it rains. And you've obviously got lots of that experience, uh, experience of that up in your neck of the woods. Um, we want to have a, a much more whole system uh, kind of approach. You know, to, to me, um, if you've got a flood somewhere and you're treating just the place where the flood happens uh, with a, a, a concrete wall or whatever, that's like putting a sticking plaster on cancer. You know, if you're getting serious flooding, it's because there are things which are not right f further up in the in the uh, system. Um, and so much better to try and be treating the whole system. Um, uh, we've got an international alliance. Uh, we help go to inform government policy and we're developing a national strategy uh, with government and other NGOs. Uh, we get people together uh, who have got interests, uh, uh, real interests in this, for example, farmers and uh, uh, fishermen and river keepers and so on. Um, and we are very into looking to lead uh, or, or support community led restoration projects, which is what this is uh, in essence. Um, and we also provide lots of uh, uh, education and comms to support and spread the knowledge and so on. Okay. Okay, we've got a huge, huge challenge. I won't go through, through this too much, but you, you know, although we've got an amazing part of the world here in the southwest of this country, still we are in a bloody mess. I, I, I'm not going to dwell too long on that, uh, um, but we are in a mess. I can tell you, soils are, are, are to hell and getting worse. Um, uh, wetlands have been most management is completely unsustainable and you know we we had five billion quids worth of floods in 2015 um and apparently across the country one in six properties at risk of flooding i was looking at uh, the, the numbers for Broughton, and um basically if it, if it uh, floods in Broughton, um the, the risk is about seven and a half million quid uh and so there's been 15 million quids worth of uh, of upset and grief and what have it have you uh, caused since since the Environment Agency uh, uh, put in their flood tank, if I've got my uh, numbers right. We have, uh, over the whole of um, over 300,000 kilometers of rivers, they go everywhere. You know, they, they, they just permeate the landscape like, like no other system that we have. They uh, share or they, they pay no um, uh, notice of political boundaries or land boundaries or anything. R the rivers go where they go and, and it is right across. And that in itself makes an incredible natural uh, uh, network. And I believe it ought to be the basis for the nature recovery network that the government is setting so much store on. I believe we need to um, uh, create buffers along our rivers so that uh, the, the wildlife in those rivers and the, the rivers themselves are protected from adverse impacts from land use next door. Um, and that Chris, I don't know if you can hear me, but you're buffering a bit. You've frozen. Land use, it Chris. I'm afraid. Adrian, did you want to add anything while we try and wait for Chris to, to come back in? Uh, so, getting back to what I'm doing, um, I'm still approaching landowners because it's an ongoing process where I, I've turned into a bit of a detective because um, the the only way I found out that successfully locates who owns what is by just finding someone on the stream and then phoning them up or emailing them and having a conversation with them and that often leads to who's next door and other people in the catchment but uh i, I i'm 
I think I've contacted around about 80 landowners and every time I think of, I know who owns a particular bit of the stream, they'll say, oh no, I don't own that. That's so, someone else that I've never heard of. And it, it, it's been a really fantastic experience and it, it's great to hear people's opinions because I, I have to tell you that not everyone is, is for the reintroduction of beavers. Um, there is a small minority that, that are against at the moment, but on the whole, um, positivity is, is remarkable. I, I'm only limited by my time because I, I'm just a volunteer. So I, I do this in my spare time. And I've only been going since November. So considering we've had lockdown, it's been quite a tricky experience because I haven't been able to go around and knock on doors. That, that's been, um, maybe that happen in the future. I think we've got Chris back. Chris, are you back with us now? I just dismissed him. Go All right. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So, so we're basically uh, um, uh, very busily just doing that, our normal daily business, um, uh, wrecking a lot of the life support system that we all depend on, and the rivers are a very, very, very important bit of that. Okay, we've got lots of rivers across the country, lots and lots and lots. They basically make a, a, a completely um, uh, universal network, which I think should be the basis for our nature recovery network, which the government is telling us about. Um, interestingly, uh, the Environment Agency have estimated that if we restored our waterways, it could generate over 21 billion benefits over 37 years. Um, uh, I, I can't comment on that. All I know is uh, when something gets flooded, it costs lots of money. And if we can reduce the risk of that, that is a good thing to be doing. Plus, there's lots of other things come along with beavers. So look at these animals here. Uh, th they were uh, present in large numbers back in prehistory and into the early historical era. era. And our civilization, along with lots of other civilizations, evolved alongside beavers uh, um, back thousands of years ago. Uh, and um, they were present here up to, uh, let's say 400 years ago, maybe a bit more recent than that, you know, that there are records here and there of beavers being present uh, since then, but if they were in very, very tiny numbers. So they're in our history, but no longer in culture. They were just about wiped out across Europe. Uh, we were down to about a thousand or so um, at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, when they were given protection. Currently, though, they've bounced back quite well. Um, well over a million, and that number is gently growing all the time. I think the interesting numbers, uh, uh, things are that there's, there were no beavers at all in Germany uh, in the uh, um, 50s. They were brought back in 1966, and now there's a, a, a 35,000 or so there. Um, Norway, they never went extinct, quite a decent number there. Sweden, where they did go extinct, lots. Uh, these places where they're in low numbers, they're only low because A, they're very small countries, but B, they've only just had the beavers reintroduced. Uh, there was a, a survey in 2018 that said we have 550 uh, in, in uh, the country. It's probably well, well over that now, mostly in Scotland, um, where uh, they actually have been protected, although they are also uh, subject to culling if they cause a nuisance. So we've been bringing them back here now for 18 or 19 years uh, into the country. Uh, into the countryside, mostly in, in enclosures, but there are there are wild populations too. Interestingly, the, the, the main wild populations have arisen from escapes from captive communities because they, they can eventually escape uh, uh, from um, enclosures and so on after a while. Um, the, there is a wild population that was purposely introduced in Scotland, however, in the West Coast, and that is going really, really well. 
Now, uh, the wild populations in, in England are basically the Tamar, the Otter, or the River Stour, and the River Avon, um, and the small numbers on the River Wye as well um, that we know about at the moment. Those numbers are, are fairly low. I, I wouldn't think there's very many more than a than, um, uh, hundred or so over on the River Stour, something similar perhaps. Uh, on the and rather less on the Avon Otter, I believe. This time. The bees um, grow very fast because uh, of their their um, their method of breeding. They only have one litter of uh, uh, kits a year, and those kits um, uh, usually in small numbers. You only get a maximum of five or six. Uh, and they're usually more like two or three. Um, and they're quite susceptible at a young age to various things like otter predation uh, and um, uh, I guess fox predation if they get outdoors. And they, uh, they reckon um, average uh, from um, uh, actually leaving to uh, form uh, another family of their own somewhere else in due course. They have impacts. There's no doubt about that. Some of those impacts are very, very positive and some of them perhaps less so, but they're all really well understood and really easily managed if we want to do it. Um, and they're actually very, very cheap to get established. Um, we estimate that about half of 1% of the total flood budget of England would pay to get beavers back here across a piece in a very purposeful uh, uh, kind of way um, if we chose to do that and that half of one percent that would include employing someone in every county in every county to be a, a, a beaver manager and it include a volunteer training budget and a vehicle and 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 so uh, it's it's uh, really not an expensive thing if we want to do it right tell you a bit about the, the beaver itself there, there is one, uh, this is uh, at uh, my farm, um, eyeing up a, a bramble. We often think that they just eat wood. They hardly ever eat wood. They, they eat tree bark sometimes, but they also eat a lot of other vegetation, including brambles and ferns and grass and so on. Um, why are they important? They're a keystone species. That is to say, uh, if they're not present, lots of things don't happen. Um, where they are present, lots and lots of other species can benefit, including Homo sapiens, I have to say. Uh, they're the second largest rodent in the world. Uh, everything else uh, that, that lives and thrives around rivers thrives much more so if you get beavers involved. I always see um, uh, waterways as being biodiversity hotspots. And if you imagine them as, as, as a little bonfire of biodiversity, if you add beavers to that mix, it's like putting on petrol. There is a massive, massive leap in the, not just the amount of biodiversity, but the actual abundance of species there. Um, their, their perfect home would be a nice deep river or a lake where they don't have to build any dams. So they're just like us, they're quite lazy. They don't, don't want to do work they don't have to do. So they would just like to, to move into a place and it'd be all ready for them. Where they don't have that deep water though, they can adapt by building dams uh, and those dams give them a depth of water deep enough to cover their uh, lodge entrance. Uh, they want it underwater so that um, predators can't get at them. And also they'll then coppice trees which lets in light and lets more ground vegetation uh, grow, which they then eat. Uh, and then they can also excavate canals so they can swim out to other feeding areas and that kind of thing. They create wetlands. And as we all know, wetlands are incredibly uh, diverse and very, very good for storing carbon. So they're a really low cost agent for nature restoration, amongst other things. They slow the flow, reducing downstream flood risk. Uh, I think for, for our purposes, that is an incredibly uh, uh, big benefit. Uh, at a place in Germany we visited 
they were due to have a million pounds spent on fl uh, a flood defence scheme. Beavers moved in upstream of them before they actually implemented the scheme and they found that they could knock two thirds off the price. Um, they improve water quality. An awful lot of the uh, phosphates and nitrates which come into uh, the, the uh, stream will settle out in beaver dams because they're quite heavy uh, particles and they will settle out uh, where they can either be removed or um, uh, used then by other aquatic wildlife. They are incredibly good uh, at uh, drought busting. In 2018, when we had really bad drought, we were able to pump out of our stream. We would not have been able to do that if it wasn't for the beavers. We would not have had a reserve of water there. Um, and so that was incredibly useful. Fish numbers uh, improve and the size of fish improves, basically because there's more water where there wasn't an, uh, uh, enough before. And also we get uh, ecotism opportunities, which is quite a, a useful thing around uh, Braunton and uh, the rest of the Southwest, where we're sort of a, a tourist magnet. Um, but also they're very, very good for mental health. The, the landscapes they uh, produce are very, very good for human well-being and, and, uh, and mental health. And I would invite anyone here to come down with Adrian and, and come and have a look around and see what they think. So just a quick illustration about how these animals improved um, the, the uh, income here um, over three years. Okay, we had them for, for six months in 2017, 12 months in 2018, and then um, that, that, that is most of 2019. We haven't computed it for next year. Um, and this is mostly either through private tourists arriving through wildlife trust visits. We are now, now that it looks like lockdown is, is uh, ending, we're getting a lot of inquiries for people to come visit. So we let our animals go here on June the 16th, 2017. Nothing happened. Uh, uh, very exciting for two days. Um, so I went down on the morning of the 17th and no nothing was doing. I went down on the morning of the 18th and I found this. And it was unmistakably a little bit of a dam starting. This is on the outlet to the pond that we put them in. And then this. In other words, these animals, when they get on with things, and uh, I can tell you, uh, within three weeks, they were building another dam downstream. And within three weeks of that, they're building another downstream, uh, dam downstream again. So three years on, lots and lots of positive changes. Uh, we'll go into the, uh, the effects on hydrology bit in a moment, um, but they split the stream. In fact, when, when uh, there's a lot of water coming through, the stream is now four channels instead of one. Um, there's a lot more water held up on the site, uh, more or less permanently. And the ground, the ground is wetter. Uh, so there's a lot of water being held in soil and so on as well. And lots of new species of, uh, of uh, animals now, at the minimum of nine of the 13 bat species uh, come and um, uh, forage uh, over the beaver pond area. So seven birds, including some quite exciting ones like green sandpiper, um, water rail, and the absolute uh, the pinnacle has been willow tits uh, have uh, uh, come back and they nested there last year. Um, and that's the first time I can ever remember having one. So it's, that's just massively exciting. So let's talk about the hydrology a little bit. This is uh, uh, data from the extra, extra University who've been involved with this from the start here. And this was before the beavers came. It's just for uh, a few days in 2016 before beavers. The red line represents water leaving the site 
and the blue line represents the water entering the site. The gray uh, uh, lines on the top, that, that's when the rainfall is actually occurring. That, those are the rain, the rain gauge uh, numbers. So points to note are, the, uh, the water leaving is always greater than the water entering. And that's because the site itself is gathering up some, some uh, uh, rain as we go. But you get a very, very close uh, mirroring or almost uh, of, the, uh, um, of, of the two uh, going in and out. Um, very, very sharp peaks and very, very sharp declines in what's going on. So this was uh, the case 10 weeks after the beavers arrived was the first time we had a, a, a decent depression pass through. And look, we've got a, a very, very different situation. The blue peak, the water entering, is still a nice sharp peak on a very rapid decline. The water leaving nowhere near reaches that peak and, and, uh, uh, and declines much, much more slowly. So in other words, if we think about the, um, the, the, the site where the beavers are, if we think about that as a, a water battery, before the beavers came, the battery was broken. In other words, it would charge up, but discharge just as quickly. And now after 10 weeks, they've begun to mend the function of that battery. And it charges up really, really fast, just as, as, as before, but it is discharging much, much more slowly. So in other words, that little bit of river is coming back into ecological function with, with that animal. Um, here's a, a picture uh, taken from a drone before the beavers arrived. You'll see that uh, to the east end of the site, there's a nice big um, pond there. And then the stream runs down across the site like this. Nearly three years later, a much, much bigger, expanded pond at the east end, and then a pond that goes around in this manner here. In fact, that's two, the two, two dams there. There's a dam uh, about there, my cursor is, sorry, and then another one just here. And there's another one that we can't see from here, just, just about here, and another one further downstream here. So we've got a series of dams there. And then just to cap it off, that winter, uh, we began to see a dam forming up here. And then since then, we've got another dam here and another dam over here. Uh, and it, it, it is completely changing the, the way that this site functions, both for hydrology and for wildlife. This was Storm Dennis. Uh, uh, that was uh, early 2020. That's how it can be. Now, if we hadn't had all the beaver dams, that there's the, the lower most beaver. If we had all the beaver dams, this water would nearly have all been just running in, in the in the ditch. But the beaver dams have split right out across the site, and you can see the channel here. Right, and there's another channel just here, uh, both to the left. And if we look sort of into the middle distance, there's another, another channel going through the woods there. And, and uh, we can just about see a channel coming in there as well. What's happening is that although there's a massive amount of water coming through, the full expansion of, of the, by the reconnection, if you like, of the stream with its floodplain. Uh, it's a fundamental part of this. And this is a, a graph again from Exeter, um, which shows uh, before the beaver, the red line, and a blue line after the beavers. And the dots, it's flood events. So the average of all those flood events is actually halved. And remember, we're dealing with just 200 meters of river uh, affecting 5% of the whole flow that comes off that catchment uh, down to Luddock. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's a, a really massive effect very, very quickly. 
And if we had, instead of one pair of beavers looking after 5% of the flow, we had 20 pairs of beavers looking after 100%, I maintain that the picture of it would be very, very different. That's how the, the issue there at all. There's still a, a, a stream coming around the side here, which is quite critical for those people who are worried about fish passage. There's a, a stream that comes around the side and that happens on, on all of the dams on our property. Um, uh, and I think that if the dams are established almost anywhere and develop uh, unimpeded, they will eventually get to that same state because the water has got to go somewhere. But the dams are so good, they don't let an awful lot of water actually through. Oh, lots of challenges. Of course, they fell trees. Um, and um, uh, that can be irritating if you've spent your time only planting them. But they're very easy to protect. And most of them aren't killed uh, uh, to boot. And if you're interested in the ecology, not everybody is, uh, if you're interested in the ecology, then the act of the tree uh, um, uh, falling over like this, it's creating a lot of deadwood, which is brilliant for insects. And that's a big part of uh, our bat populations increasing and our, and our bat diversity increasing. Um, uh, but also it lets a lot of light in as well. And if you let light in, more stuff can You can reduce the level of ponds if you need to because of localized flooding. Now, uh, in, in the kind of application we're talking about here with having beavers up above Braunton, the localized flooding will be happening somewhere where it doesn't matter with the aim of reducing it where it does matter. Uh, I talked about fish passage just now. Now, if you've got a really deeply incised channel, uh, that could be hard for the beavers to, 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 uh, to dam enough if you like to um, enable fish passage around. Uh, if you leave them long enough, that will develop. I think there's, there's uh, no doubt in my mind about that. Uh, but if it is causing a serious problem for fish passage, it's not difficult to actually uh, remove a dam or at least to reduce its height so that uh, uh, fish can still move. Oops, sorry. Um, crop raiding. If you're if you're growing uh, maize or uh, sugar beet or something really yummy right next to the water, beavers will come and raid it. But the beavers tend to stay within twenty uh, <coughs> sorry twenty meters of the river, and so the chances of um, beavers coming into your crops if you're set back to the river a little bit are very very low. And also you can protect them with a simple electric fence. They can cause damage to flood banks as well. I'm not sure there's much in the way of flood banks in the, um, in the Braunton catchment. Um, I'll, I'll probably be told wrong, uh, uh, different in a minute, but um, th there's not very much that I'm aware, of. but they can be repaired and they can also be guarded too if needs be. Um, and if beavers are in a place and they're causing a problem, they're not that hard to catch. And, you know, they didn't go extinct in the first place because they were difficult to catch. They went extinct because they were very, very easy to catch and uh, they, they were a, a valuable dead for their fur and their glands. So um, it, it's not that big a deal to, to catch them and take them somewhere else. I would add, uh, as, we, uh, um, as we develop the uh, project of Braunton, uh, our plan is to uh, have them in areas up in the headwaters and uh, and catchment, uh, certainly to begin with anyway. So solutions are available uh, and they're cheap and straightforward uh, and there are people who know how to do it and who can train more people how to do it if necessary. There is a lot of knowledge in other parts where beavers were also nearly extinct uh, and brought back, back in and uh, the, the, that, that knowledge is uh, manifest in USA and Europe but also uh, we've got a lot of experience from Scotland now and we've got some really good people funny enough working for the trust who, who uh, have been managing beaver problems there for years. The main thing is that we uh, do our best to deconflict um, uh, beavers with 
uh, farming with buffer trip strips. I would add that certainly from what I've seen of the Broughton catchment, very with farming as it happens. Um, uh, I think that the, the really bad areas, or, or rather the, the the kind of area where there could be significant um, uh, impact on farming would be somewhere like uh, Lincolnshire Fens or uh, uh, potentially the uh, Somerset Levels. Down here in, uh, in most of the West Country, there is not much scope just because our gradients are too steep, um, both uh, across the stream and in the stream. Yes, yeah, so so I I just uh, uh, say that issues are uh, usually very small scale and they're localized and simply resolved. Um, but what we do need is to, have, is to have lots of education and practice practical support where it's needed, and um, uh, 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 an experience. I guess that's the thing is 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 uh, getting that that experience of of living with uh, another species of animal. Oops, sorry. Okay, so we, we started up a, um, a, a bit of a, a strategy session in uh, Cornwall last year, and um, we, we've been using our site here as an education tool. Uh, we, we actually had a, a sort of an official summit last year with the council um, uh, and various other stakeholders, including farming, including uh, um, the uh, Southwest Water and including the Environment Agency and so on and so forth. We thought we'd get about 25 people, in fact, 50 people turned up, and we now have an active generation of a beaver strategy for the whole county of Cornwall, um, uh, which is being worked on now, which is really good. Uh, there's, there's a fisherman showing that beavers aren't bad for fish. He's, he's uh, uh, fishing in a place where there's a lot of beavers uh, in Scotland. And he's very, very firmly the opinion that, that they can be very good for fish. I tend to share that opinion, having seen uh, um, our place, actually, uh, that fish numbers grow and the size of fish grow. Very confusing policy landscape at the moment because we're looking at um, uh, a, uh, a change, I think, uh, more or less imminent. But uh, when I say that, um, Sometime in the next six months to a year, I think there's going to be a change in policy um, from the government. But at the moment, uh, in England, they're not recognised or protected, uh, although they are on the uh, red list. Um, they are uh, in Scotland and Europe and North America. Um, we are uh, supposed to, by European law, which we're still adhering to, um, to protect and restore uh, once native species. Um, they have to be fenced in an enclosure currently, but they're not on the dangerous animals list, so you ask the question why. Um, and take a lot of time and money and expertise to, uh, to, to uh, complete. So it's, it's not all... Um, it's not all one-way traffic by any means. We've had the river otter beaver trial, where broadly speaking, uh, a population of uh, about 100 beavers now is living uh, pretty much in, uh, in Concord with uh, local farmers and so on. And, and the amount of conflict is really, really limited. We think we're going to be going forward into a, into a time when it will be possible to deliberately release beavers into open uh, uh, situations. Um, and we think probably there'll be some kind of protection. We don't know what exactly yet, but probably. Um, we also have the situation in Scotland where they are protected, a license is being issued to cull them where they're causing a nuisance. Interestingly, none have been issued at all for uh, fisheries purposes. They've only been issued uh, um, for farming um, impact, and mainly because there is no fisheries uh, impact observed in Scotland. So there you go. Um, really, uh, I think the, the focus uh, could be when this animal is so scarce, should be uh, uh, focusing on, on uh, management and coexistence. Uh, no, management and coexistence. Uh, 
and, and try and get away from closure and control. But I absolutely take the point, um, and it's fundamental to my thinking that we need uh, settled into quite critical bits of a landscape in order to, to kick, kick start the natural flood management work. Okay, Bavaria is a wonderful example, lots and lots of beavers there. Um, now, uh, th those numbers are going up all the time. Um, quite a big population of people. The area is about the size of Wales. There are uh, very, very intensive uh, uh, farming landscapes with beavers in them, and they buy pretty well. They are uh, uh, culling beavers every year, but nowhere near as many as are, are, are being born. So the population is still growing. Um, uh, it's still doing more good, if you like, and the authorities are absolutely not shy of uh, removing beavers, uh, either lethally or by translocation, um, at any time if there is actual conflict taking place. So it's they're, they're very happy to treat actual conflict uh, ra rather than uh, perceived conflict. Uh, and the way they do it is, uh, and I think Braunton could be, if we if we get there with the, the beavers, could be a great example of this. Um, basically, every parish has a beaver consultant uh, or a beaver warden, and they're volunteers. And um, there are two um, fully employed managers in, in uh, the whole of Bavaria, and they, they each have a uh, an army of consultants. And those people, they only get paid when they get deployed, if you like. And the reason they have so many is that in every locality, every parish, everybody there knows who the beaver person is, so they know who to phone up. And it works, uh, and that farmers uh, uh, have confidence in it because the uh, beaver consultant, he's contracted to react within 24 hours of receiving a complaint. Um, and ideally, and they really push this on the same day. Uh, and that means that, that uh, people can have confidence that if they've got a problem, it's gonna get sorted out. So we could do the national strategy, it's coming along, we're working on it. Uh, and, and I believe once the politicians make up their mind about it, I think they'll be working on it too. I don't need to go into it anymore. So how can we help? Uh, well, we can run uh, uh, or, or provide presentations like this. We can support local communities. Um, we can increase public support generally by uh, um, making films and so on. We did one last year called Beavers Without Borders. We're doing another one this year called uh, Living on the Edge. Oh, <clears throat> and, and that's gonna show us about um, the, the benefits of uh, introduce, introducing buffers and so on. Lots and lots of other things there, but we, we, we don't need to go into that now. Listen, um, thank you very much for listening. Um, it's a very whistle-stop tour through Be Beaver Trust and, uh, uh, and Beavers and Braunton. Um, to, to answer the, 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 the bit on the, um, on the first page, uh, the title page, yeah, I think beavers could really help uh, Broughton if we can get them established in the right place in sufficient numbers. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. If you want to stop well, sharing, so your, if you want to stop yeah, sharing your screen, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Okay. And then we can open it up for questions. I'll just change my view so I can see everybody. Um, so, um, thank you for that, Chris. It was so amazing to see the positive benefits, especially all of the rapid changes that happened on your land there. Um, so, if you'd like to ask Chris or Adrian a question, if you want to pop your question in the chat, alternatively, if you want to use the raised hand icon, um, and then we can unmute you and you could ask your question. Let's have a look. I'm sure lots of people will be um, interested in volunteering. And um, Sally says, are there any problems with dogs off leads killing beavers? Um, uh, uh, very few. Um, one thing, the beavers have an incredibly good sense of smell. And if they smell a dog, what they're smelling is a wolf and they'll be into the water as quickly as it possibly can be. 
what I would also say is that uh, if if a dog actually made contact with a beaver, a beaver will fight to defend itself, uh, and particularly a female beaver with kits, she would really fight to, to, to defend them, and they have an incredibly uh, um, fearsome set of teeth, and uh, um, I, I would say it would not be a foregone conclusion as to who would come out on top of that. Um, and if a dog jumped in the water, I think it would make a big mistake too. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I think that's Thank enough said. <laughs> um, so Paul was asking, is there a map to show where the beavers could be introduced locally? Adrian, have you got as far as developing that information? I, I do have a landowner map that I um, mark on who who is Paul, who I who I've contacted and hasn't hasn't replied and and who is against. Um, so I, yes, I do have that. I'm developing it, that at the moment, and also uh, we have another map in production which um, is way more detailed than my landowner map. Mm. Um, which has specific lay different layers uh, on it to show things like flood data and where we're thinking about, um, well, wh where Beaver Trust is thinking about putting beavers at the moment, but that's a, a constantly evolving map because things are changing all the time. More landowners are coming on board uh, with discovering different things about the catchment. So that, that will change over time as we put more time into, into this process and we learn more. So, but yes, there, there are two maps on the go at, right at the moment, yes. So watch the space then. Um, yes. so, so how many, uh, yeah, so Paul, I, I just, oh, sorry, Chris, go on. I, I was just going to add to that. Um, uh, at the moment, the main, focus is on the uh, the cane uh, uh, upstream of Head and Mills to the source and uh, and then the stream that goes up to West End. There is almost universal um, uh, landowner uh, um, approval, if you like, uh, certainly from Butter Hills and upwards. Um, and uh, we, it, it, there's a reasonably good place there to put a, a, a barrier uh, that would uh, stop beavers going downstream and there's enough space above to introduce several pairs of beavers and they could be getting to work in there uh, and, and starting to, to really um, uh, get, you know, re really, really begin to affect the hydrology of that tributary. Um, there is some lovely habitat up uh, the stream that comes down past, uh, from Trimstone, um, and the golf course, I can't remember its name, uh, um, that comes down through Bradwell. Um, but we, I haven't really got quite enough definite landowner support uh, to put more than one pair of beavers up there. And I don't really want to have one pair of beavers isolated in a tributary to start off with, because it will, uh, it will, um, it will be so much, if we can get to there, uh, then that will allow them to be more or less free, freely in, into breeding and so on, um, or their offspring anyway, and that will give us a lot of uh, uh, a lot less management headache early on. Um, and then there's another similar uh, 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 possibility at Spraycombe, some lovely uh, um, lovely territory up there, uh, but we just haven't got quite enough. Uh, uh, landowner support yet, although you know we, we're we're talking to or the agents talking to people all the time, and I, I'm I'm quite hopeful that that's going to come. I think in both of those those cases, um, and I think we should remember we're not asking landowners can we put beavers on your land. What we're saying is, uh, when beavers come, can you tolerate them being there? And if you've got a problem with them, can you uh, uh, speak to whoever the designated person is? And uh, and then we can work together to to sort out whatever the issue is. So uh, it's that that's the the kind of ask if you like. Brilliant. And there's a Thank lovely you. map being produced. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, and what are the Richard's asking? What are the time scales from starting the project to actually um, having the beavers deployed in the area? What sort of time scales are we looking at? 
Well, um, my experience is that broadly speaking, the fastest you can go from having the idea to getting beavers in is about two years. Um, uh, and th th that, that's if everything falls right, if, if, the, if the, um, the feasibility work shows that, that beavers can work there uh, and live there, uh, if um, the licensing people can be um, uh, brought to heel and, and, and uh, issue a license, and if the funding is in place, then yeah, I, I think about to a plus also you've then got, then got to go and trap the beavers. No one's going to trap any beavers unless someone's got a license to, to excuse me, to, to have them because uh, what are you going to do with them otherwise? So um, yeah, that there's a, there's a few things that have to be gone through. I'm not saying it couldn't be quicker. It could be, but there is a massive red tape. Thank you, Chris. Um, and Emma is asking, are there any common health problems that beavers suffer? Um, and does that affect their reproduction rates? Um, th that's a, a really, um, that's a really good uh, uh, question. Um, I mean, I, I think I, I should add at uh, this stage, I, I'm actually a farmer myself and, and keep cattle and, and what have you. and, and uh, Thank God, touching wood firmly. We've we've never had TB here, but we've got a lot of badges, and we could get TB. I would be very unhappy if I thought I was bringing a, a, a TB risk back to the farm. I don't think there is any uh, uh, known risk of TB with uh, um, beavers and cattle, or beavers and anything. Um, uh, there are um, there is a uh, a parasite they can carry, which isn't very nice. If they're coming in from Europe and they haven't been vetted, um, uh, but that hasn't happened, so that hasn't happened uh, here. Um, oh, I, I'm I'm just trying to, to 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 think what what other things. I mean, you know, I I guess they could carry ticks. They could, you know, it's a wild animal living out in the wild. I'm sure it could carry all sorts of uh, little things. My recommendation is. Uh, uh, don't go kissing any strange beavers. Don't 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 try and eat a raw one. Um, uh, never go to bed with one. That's sort of, you know, <laughs> and, and you'll be fine. <laughs> Thanks for that advice, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> <Here to help>. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so um, uh, so the next question is from Jay, and they said, that, um, "What is the significance, if any, of all the new housing developments bringing up everywhere on the ecology?" And does this have a lasting change for the landscape, threatening the chance of um, rewilding? Sorry, I just lost the question then. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so re rewilding for the, for the beavers. And if so, is this something that we should be challenging as communities? So the impact of new housing development. Um. Well, you're a parish councillor there, Adrian, perhaps that's one for you. Okay, um, the new developments in Braunton, um, because they're near Braunton it, itself, they are not going to impact on this scheme. But of course, every new development could impact it. Well, it, it does have an impact. You, you know, there, there's face it, there, there's land that didn't have housing on and roads is, is being changed into that. So, so of course, we, we have to think more carefully and as, as a society, I mean, with, within the parish council, we're, we're developing a neighborhood plan at the moment and we are very aware of the issues of new housing developments, particularly from with climate change, we're thinking about flooding not only from rivers into new properties, because they, they often because the good land has been used up for previous developments. Um, well, town planners are looking at floodplains, and, and in in my opinion, that is a grave mistake. Mm -hmm. um, and and that every, I I think every councillor on Braunton Parish Council would say the same. But often government, central government has pressure to deliver housing. So there, there's a big conflict right across the country there. And that leads to flooding issues within properties. But 
we, we, we've got to look, think about how to deal with su housing supply and flooding and climate change. That, that is one of the issues of our times. But yes, mm. absolutely. Every time you, you build houses, there, there is a potential damage to the env natural environment. Of course, it's disappearing. Thank you for that, Adrian. Um, and then Paul asks, where would the beavers be relocated from? Um, uh, almost certainly Scotland. Um, uh, one of my colleagues is uh, called Rasheen Campbell Palmer, uh, and she lives up in Scotland, uh, travels back and forth quite a bit. But um, she, in the trapping season, she is up there trapping beavers to prevent them being shot. Uh, and um, uh, she, she is definitely of the opinion that, that uh, if we can move them from there to here and, and save lives, when the numbers are so low uh, as, as they are across the country, um, uh, that, that is a very good thing. So they'll almost certainly come from Scotland. Um, there are a few surplus ones coming from other projects within, within England now, but they're in very, very meager numbers. So um, yeah, almost certainly from Scotland. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is about the, the benefits. And obviously we've talked a lot about the flooding prevention benefits. Um, but this question is said, uh, what about promoting the wider um, benefits such as ecotourism on the local uh, economy? And would that sort of idea be useful in convincing landowners? Well, certainly I think any, any farmer who, or any uh, owner of a guest house or a campsite would, would be very, very pleased to have beavers around because they are incredibly fascinating animals uh, and lots of people want to go and see them. So I think having them in the area would be a, a, a real draw. I think that there's no doubt about that. Um, and there are other uh, wider benefits too, I think are, are, are in terms of flooding, um, and in terms of, there's no question, uh, sorry, uh, uh, not for, uh, a drought rather. Um, you know, we often skate over that, but I think more and more, uh, if these trends continue that we're seeing at the moment, then, um, th then drought is gonna become a, a very, very big deal. Uh, as well as the, the uh, cleaning up of the water, the, um, the estuary, uh, I believe there's a project uh, over the, the uh, waters in the estuary to try and get them cleaned up. You know, uh, uh, shellfishers in this country can't export their, their shellfish to France or, or to Europe because our waters aren't clean enough. That's a disgrace. Uh, and you know, that's not water coming from the sea into the estuary. That's water coming off the land into the estuary that's causing those problems. And we need to fix that. Um, and we could do it without beavers, I expect, but it would be massively expensive. Or we can start to repair the uh, ecology and the function of our of our rivers and streams, and this is a good way to do it. Absolutely. Um, Richard's asking, um, what's the minimum area or length of river that you need for a beaver family? Uh, Richard, that, that does vary a bit depending on how good the habitat is. Um, obviously, if, if there's a place that's got more food, uh, um, uh, available then it doesn't need as much ground to do it on but we as a rule of thumb we talk about a kilometre um, and um, uh, uh, and that is that's what's driving my views on how many pairs of beavers we can release uh, um, in the different um, tributaries. Oh I didn't mention the Knoll Water before the Knoll Water has got some lovely place a bit for beavers as well. Um, now the um, uh, yes, yeah, so what I don't want to do is to put uh, a capacity crowd of beavers in to uh, 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 the tributary right from the word go because very soon we'd have to start moving them out again, and and that would just be a pain. Whereas uh, if we give them enough space for them to grow into and to establish more families on uh, over the years, that that seems to me to be a, a pretty sound approach. Fantastic. Um, and there's a couple of questions about um, um, a, a beavers being looked at um, to be reintroduced in any other catchments in North Devon. Are you working with anybody else, Chris? Well, uh, fun enough, Adrian and I were visiting um, a, a place not long ago, and there's someone there who was a, a Coombe Martin 
uh, parish council and he, and he said oh that would be good for us too uh, so that was that was quite interesting and uh, since talking to the environment agency about what we're, we're thinking of uh, they confirmed that and said yes Ku Martin is somewhere they're looking to to uh, to do things so there we go Wow, that's very exciting to hear. So this idea is definitely catching on, isn't it? Which is fantastic. It is, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Um, Adrian, did you, um, we haven't got any more questions, but did you want to say a little bit more about how people can get involved or help you out or volunteer or find out more? Uh, uh, yes, I, earlier on in the chat, I put my contact details. Um, please feel free to contact me by email or phone, that's absolutely fine. Um, I will be looking for volunteers because when Chris and I have wandered around the catchment, um, there are several areas where willow sticks need to be planted and we, we need to plant those in clumps, get those established before the beavers arrived and protect them with poles and sheep netting. Um, so if anyone knows where to get hold of that, that kind of material, we like recycling things. So we like recycled poles and recycled sheep netting. So if anyone's got any ideas on, on that one. And the other thing is um, we need to clip willow, short lengths of willow um, off already established local trees. So if anyone knows where, I mean, I've, I've seen, I live in Knoll and just to wander over to the River Cane flowing through Knoll, there are several really excellent willow trees I've got here, but, but it'd be nice to find some in different parts of the catchment. So we, we, we could just clip, literally clip some um, short lengths off a willow on site and, and plant them. It would, it would make life pretty easy. So if, if anyone's got any ideas on that one, love to hear from you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and I, I'm sure it's a good idea if we start collecting willow now then, <laughs> so we can start planting it. So fantastic. So we'll draw the evening to uh, close there. So thank you very much, uh, Chris and Adrian, and thank you everyone for coming um, this evening. And thank you all for your support. And um, what I can do, Adrian, is I'll send everybody um, uh, email following the um, talk tonight just to let them know your details and um and also chris's details as well and i'm sure some of us would love to come down and see chris on his farm as well so we can see for ourselves and um, so if you'd all like to join me in a virtual thumbs up or round of applause and um, thank you for a very interesting and informative evening thank you chris and adrian Thank you very much indeed for, for having us. Uh, and um, I hope you haven't caused uh, uh, too much dissension about, about these uh, crazy animals. And look forward to seeing you um, around, uh, around the catchment as the weeks go by. I shall be up again next week for a couple of days. Yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.